employees. And then lastly, with the um, provide options to enhance on-call uh, job shifts in police, as we did uh, analysis, as you'll see in the write-up, for the most part, we do that throughout the system with the exception of police, so it makes sense to, to have it also. If we go down to the financial partners, and um, what I'd like to do is just throw something out there that, um, you know, typically we have this financial partners process, and some of these groups may have been a part of it and some not. But I would uh, go back to where Sean is going to talk later today at the action briefing, and maybe you'll call them up during the budget adjustments, um, where virtually all of these organizations would qualify for that opportunity under the um, grassroots organizations community partners um, RFP that opened up on the 18th. And, um, and it's just something to, to discuss. And then lastly, I would say that under the new initiatives, the add a research policy position to support city council, uh, which totally makes a, a great deal of sense back under the personnel, even though it's something new. Um, if, if I added that to that 1.2 million, um, I know there's a better term, but we're within spitting distance of being able to have all of those programs taken care of under the 1.2 million. But just something to think about as you start to discuss this. I just wanted you to know that there's more opportunities than just going back into the budget when we have some of those one-time ARPA funds that are available. But again, one-time uh, ARPA funds and just food for thought as you begin the process. Sorry. Are there any questions for the manager um, based upon on the first section under employee pay? The manager has said items one, two, and six could be covered. Um, if I say this incorrectly, Ryan, let me know. Under our financial partners, the manager is suggesting that during the action briefing that there will be an opportunity to have a process for all of these um, organizations, those that have did not compete or did not submit proposals to have an opportunity to submit proposals to be funded under ARPA. And under the new initiatives, he's suggested that the research policy position to support council would be feasible. So now questions, Mr. Mitchell. Madam Mayor, thank you. C City Manager, I just want to be clear. And so on the opera, I have $17 million for housing, um, 3.7 for workforce development, and then Sean is going to talk about 2.5 for grassroots organization, RFP open up on May 18, and then 6.5 for housing supportive grant, 6.5 million remaining for housing supportive grant. That, that, that's ex exactly right, uh, Councilmember Mitchell. And again, Sean is in the room if there needs to be any explanation about um, how these programs may work. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. All right. Ms. Mayfield? Thank you, Madam Mayor. So, Mr. Manager, the question I was going to ask is regarding my item number four, of which staff gave a response on page six of the packet that we received, and it runs into page seven, but I'm not really clear what this response is saying for my specific ask of what we identified is that we were looking at outdated numbers when we were looking at access to housing today for our employees and knowing that the amount currently even with the proposal of going to 46 is still going to be a challenge so i asked for staff to bring back numbers if the starting pay was boosted to 50,000 for those that are in that 41 to 46 range if we if it was boosted up I'm looking at the response to it and then it states in here that the overall action would increase the average hourly pay by 13% in fiscal year 24 doing this re would require a significant compression pool for salaried employees who overlap with hourly workers. So help me understand exactly what staff is saying here. Sure. So, uh, Councilmember Mayfield, I'll start off by saying that uh, thank you for putting that 
in the room last time we were together, and uh, we all um, agree that properly compensating our employees so that they are able to live in the city is, is, a, is a priority. Um, and I'll turn it over to Ryan and the team. It's, it's just a couple things. It's just um, as we boost salaries, starting salaries, there's a ripple effect all the way up the organization, and you get issues such as compression. So that's to some extent why you see the big number, but I'll mm -hmm. turn it over to, I guess, Ryan and maybe a tag team with HR. But Yeah, so um, page six is where the adjustment is. We also provide additional context to your question um, on pages 19 and 20, which are in the Q&A section. Uh, so the way that we recommended increasing minimum pay at the last adjustments was to do something that guaranteed all hourly employees get at least $3,600. And doing it that way doesn't provide as much compression because there's, no, uh, there's only about 30 salaried employees under $60,000. And 60,000 is what I say because the proposal that we had put out there doesn't change anything for the hourly employees above 60,000. Um, one of the ways that we've increased uh, starting pay over the last number of years is these kind of methodical increases from the bottom so we can avoid the issues where you have an hourly employee who may have been promoted twice, uh, might have got new training to get promoted, and then we bring the floor way up and they are now matched up with people who are just starting. So. Uh, I think it was about three or four years ago we were paying 33,000 as the minimum salary. In 22, FY22, we went to 38,000. Last year we went to 41,000. This year we'd be talking to go, going to 46,200. If you wanted to go higher than that, like up to 50,000, which is what we costed out, the only real way to avoid compression is to basically make sure all hourly employees get like $7,400. And then when you do that, you're essentially giving um, a pretty significant increase all the way up hourly employees, all the way up to like 100,000. And so when you do that, there is a significant overlap with salaried employees too. Uh, we have a lot of salaried employees that make 70s, 80,000 that supervise hourly employees. And so you'd have to adjust both ends of the equation. So once you were able to run the numbers to calculate, what you all have identified is that for right now, the best path forward will get us our hourly employees to around 46 two. Yeah, and I guess what I would say is in the past, we've taken multi-year approaches where we've even talked about what we want to do over a number of years. Uh, getting to 46,200 is something we could do within the existing sources and it doesn't cause significant compression, but you can continue to make steady gains like that over the next number of years if that's the will of the council. But that additional 4,000 will put us into a space where we would run into that compression with our salary workers. Well, I, I, no, I think what I would say is like next year, for instance, you could do something similar again and increase another $5,000 at the bottom and it wouldn't create um, nearly as much compression issues because you'd also be giving salaried employees their regular three or four percent increase at the same time. Okay, that's what I wanted to make sure that I was understanding. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Manager. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I wanted to suggest that we go through this in these two sections or the three sections that are listed um, in the order and then at that point walk through those and then also new ideas and suggestions for things that the staff would actually have to do additional work on. So if you can pull out on page three, the um, first one is employee pay. And so in this case, we would have um, council members ready to decide on one, two, three, four, five, and six. So why don't we start with item number one, 
which came from Ms. Ashmira, Ms. Johnson, Mr. Driggs, and Mr. Bakari to maintain the pay parity with police and fire at the cost of $330,000. Um, mm -hmm. So um, personally, uh, the two additional adjustments I would recommend us researching relate to employee pay and really do relate to these first now because I just don't know. I think if it is applicable, I think that you should go ahead and put it on the floor, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Um, so I w wanted to draw attention. Well, both, like I said, both of the adjustments that I have relate to um, employee compensation. Um, and it's, you know, after, after consulting the information that staff provided based on the questions that were asked, you know, I think um, our organization's objective, objectively our number one priority is providing the municipal services that um, we are uniquely positioned uh, to, uh, to, to provide in this community, whether it be picking up solid waste or making sure the, the water lines run or uh, providing emergency services and, and what has been clear over the past few years is that it's very hard to, to keep um, the, the spectrum of employees that is needed. Um, we see that, for instance, um, folks that get CDL licenses or certain certifications in, in Charlotte Water are finding uh, more opportunity in um, the private sector, right? And those are, those are, those, the, and, and that's something that they have to do, right? Especially when it comes to um, dealing with the inflationary um, uh, situation that, we, that, that we're in. Um, on page 24, in response to question seven, what effect does inflation have on wages? Um, staff provided uh, three fiscal years, uh, fiscal year 22, 23, and projections for 24. Um, unless my math is incorrect, uh, it, it when you when you um, put in those projections, hourly salaries have only increased 1.9 percent when you combine those three fiscal years. And if you look at the salary pool, um, you actually see a drop of of negative 5.1 percent when it comes to the real effects of salaries. That means that it's much more difficult for us to retain. Our uh, um, workers. That means it's harder for those workers um, to just maintain um, their status quo. Um, I, I would suggest that we look at um, a compensation increase uh, that gets both of those pools to a three percent projection. Um, uh, give um, when you when you figure for those inflation projections. Secondly. If we go back to um, page 15, item number 17, um, I asked a question um, about the fiscal impact uh, that the fire service uh, incurs um, when it comes uh, to the medic calls uh, and the medic service that we have to supplement uh, and supply. So uh, it, it was shown that Charlotte Fire gets a flat annual contract rate of $499,035 from Mech, Medic in the county. Um, and then uh, we get uh, a rate that amounts for about five, $5 per call. Um, the towns on the other side get a monthly stipend of $1,027, but they get $20.55 per call. So inherently, the city is supplementing, well, it's, it's, it's supplementing. They are not, we are not receiving, the fire service is not receiving 1,187,000, 1, $1,187,606 per year. That is money that is not going to the fire service that could be used for additional personnel, uh, that could be used for wages, that could be used for equipment that is it, that could be needed to, to run um, a, a fire service that um, better fits a growing uh, community. 
So I would ask that we make an adjustment that we put another $1,187,606 um, into the fire service from somewhere in our budget. Thank you. So let's go back and start with number one for the section so we can get the questions for each one and then add the other two that Mayor Pro Tem has submitted. Um, but make sure that you've seen them up here. Employee compensation, that's all employees. Yep. Um, 3% in addition above the inflation rate for the last three years. Yes. That, is that correct? Yes. All right. And then the fire service would get... 1.1 1. 1, 1. 1 million, well, almost 1.9 million um, for 1 million 187. That I can go and do. I was just rounding it up for you a little bit. I mean, but if you get past 1.87, 1. 1.9 is okay. Yeah. Okay. So, but you that would be for that would become that would come out of some funding source for first responder services or fire services okay all right why don't we go ahead and tackle the first one which was miss ashmira miss johnson mr driggs and mr bakari on maintain pay of pi pa pay parity with police and fire which is i believe the five percent rule that they have historically had so with that um in this situation we would need to have votes to move this forward, five votes to move this forward to the decision-making meeting where there would be a need to put six votes for it. So is there any questions for anyone on what this means, what it costs, and the intent and purpose? Hearing, all right, Mr. Bakari. I just, just a, a point of uh, process. I'm wondering, given that we've kind of raised several of these items up in the last meeting that we were supportive. We've got feedback on the majority of them. There's two new ones and then some others. Is it possible that we might take our straw votes on ones that we believe are strongly supported today and see where we end up at the end of the meeting to cut a step out of all this? That would be up to the council. Um, we could do those, and if there were six or more votes, then the manager could go ahead and incorporate those. But I think the council would have to understand that that's what that would be done today. So is that a, something that you would like to see done? I, I would like to propose if we have six or more votes on any item that's been well vetted out, that we go ahead and agree that that's the, we're taking the straw vote, essentially. Um, and if it's five or whatever, then we continue forth. All right. So you've heard what Mr. Bakari suggested. Mr. Driggs? Um, my only comment about that is <clears throat> if you don't get six votes today, does that mean it doesn't, or does that mean that we didn't accelerate the adoption, but we'll still think about it next time? Yeah, I, I think that just based on how the strategy normally works, if you get six or more, we know there's support and we have all the details we're going to get. If there's five that's saying we need more info, then obviously we put them in that bucket. And if there's less than five, then there, it would be dead anyway. Well, I think if, to the extent that there could be the uncertainty on some people's part today, and therefore it's possible you don't get to six, but that doesn't mean you couldn't. So I would, I would be a little nervous about preempting the possibility of adoption if we fail to get to six today. I, I think that that could be solved by just, because it won't be a lot of them. It, it will only be a couple, and I think we would just designate the difference between asking for straw votes today versus asking for more information and having support. And I, my only suggestion is that we not eliminate anything that doesn't get there today. So we, if we can get some of them adopted because everybody's ready and you've got your six votes, let's do it and not talk about it anymore. If we can't reach that point today, then I think the thing should stay alive until the next time. Okay. So you understand that if it's six, then we could go ahead and the manager would incorporate it in the budget, present budget adoption, and anything else would come back. And I would hope that if it's not five or not six and it's five, that there is a question to be answered to get to six or, or deliberations among each other, that we could actually move that forward as quickly as we could. All right. So um, 
Madam Mayor. Is there anyone, uh, Mr. Drew? Uh, I did actually have a comment before Mr. Bakari spoke that I wanted to make as well. Okay, can I, um, I've got a list here already. So I. But oh, okay, if I'm on there, that's fine. Yeah, you are on the list. Thank you. And you are recognized now, followed by Ms. Mayfield, Mr. I, Briggs. I just wanted to say I'm all in support of the firefighters and the parity. Uh, I would like to understand what the implications are as we project for the next couple of years of taking this action now. Like if we commit to parity now, are we setting ourselves up for costs in the future that uh, we'll need to figure out? Or how difficult is that, Mr. Manager? Sure, so I think uh, you know, sometimes you, you ask for a do-over, right? Um, I think what happened with what I proposed was um, there wasn't clarity whether or not this decoupling would be forever, okay? And so I guess lessons learned. Um, I think if it's the policy of this council that these two organizations that are great organizations would always be coupled, then we would live with it. I think the flexibility is, is, is important sometimes when you have an anomaly. But, you know, after last uh, Thursday and all the great work from both police and fire, it's real tough to say anything other than just um, support for these brave folks. And so, yes, there would be financial implications in the future. What it may mean is that if you had a budget challenge, that to keep this 5% differential, you may do less for both, right? Or, you know, uh, you may have a situation where to keep them, you know, together, you may have different needs in each organization, but if that's the overlying um, concept is that they should be coupled, then we would have to address that it, with each budget that comes along. So I, I would like to do this this year and not have it be the same as a policy decision that we can't talk about again in the future, i.e. this is a, uh, a budget decision right now and not a council decision uh, forever, as it were. And, you know, subject to everybody's agreement, but I'm just making that distinction so we understand. All right. Ms. Mayfield? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just wanted clarification since we're on number one. The, the recommendation that came from Councilmember Bakari, is that something that we needed to vote on or we're just in agreement? Because it made sense that if we have the six, we just keep it moving. We, we're saying you didn't need a vote from us on that. I it's will just need consensus. a vote from that, but I was just recognizing people on this number one to comment. So Okay, and the second part, second part of my question, the recommendation made by Mayor Pro Tem, is a separate recommendation that is not going to, and this is a question, his recommendation is not going to impact number one? No. Okay. Well, I think it, I don't know the answer to that. We, his recommendations came today, so we will have to review those in the context of the total next week. So, may, I, I think his item would ultimately be something across the board that you, after we made these decisions, could potentially raise other things. But at, at a floor level for support of these things, it's not an either or. Right. So it would come back. And the manager was Mr. getting Jones. ready to yes. say something. Uh, so I'm just trying to get a little help, uh, Ryan. So how does, and Mayor Portem, I'm mm -hmm. trying to help your position too, okay. So Ryan, the, the, when money comes in like this, does, does it just go into the general fund, or does this medic response fund, is it tied directly to fire? So specific to what medic pays us, you're talking about? Yeah, it comes in as a revenue, um, but uh, I, I guess before we go further, I need a little bit of clarification. Are, are, are we saying that we should work on getting that raised and anything we get raised will lock to make sure that it automatically goes to the fire department? Or are we saying we would increase the expenditure budget now and try to find another source now while we try to work on that additional revenue? Well, that's, I guess I'm trying to get clarification, but let's start with the first thing. I, th I think the money just comes in. Okay, so I think there are two issues. The first issue is, is the city 
proper, properly being compensated for the medic services that it provides for the throughout the county, which I think is, is question one. And the data would suggest that this is something that we should be exploring, which I do believe the chiefs have been exploring. And I think that's kind of easy. I, I guess the second question to you, Mayor Portem, if it's additional resources to fire for equipment, salaries, things of that nature, um, I, I don't know if that needs to be connected to the, the medic. It, it makes it easier to have more resources for fire, but I just don't know how you would like for us to implement it. I, are, you, are you prepared to address that now? All right. And, and I don't mean to, and, and if it's you want us to come up with recommendations, we can do that too. I just want to well, make no, sure. Well, no, I just, I had it as we go down the list and then we come back to it. I just want, don't want to have to rush you to say, well, this is what we're going to do now. So, well, up to me, you. Me, you can go back to research. But mm -hmm. the way, the, the response that staff provided me to the question that was asked was that we are short one point one one million one hundred eighty seven thousand dollars six hundred six dollars if we were equitably paid for the fire service the medic service that our fire service provides to the rest of the county uh, that means that our fire service is not getting those resources and I would like to provide them with those resources how we do that I will certainly like you to come back to us I'm not going to try to micromanage how, how, you, how you do do that Thank you. All right. Okay, we're still on number one. So, Ms. Ashmira, followed by Ms. Watlington. Ms. Ashmira. Oh, my question is being addressed. All right. Ms. Watlington. Thank you. I just had a process question um, as it relates to what Mr. Bakari was suggesting. Just so I'm clear, there's enough funding and to address all these adjustments? Because I'm trying to get a feeling of if we if we move more forward by virtue of a six count vote and we don't have funding for all of it, well then that comes back to a priority discussion. So I just want right. to understand that. Yes, so I, I would say that within the 1.2 million and within the ARPA opportunities, everything could be funded with these exceptions. Item three, which is somewhere between six million and twelve million dollars. Item four, which is um, three point six million, and that's just in the employee pay piece. When you go to, down to the financial partners, whatever the council decides, there's an opportunity through uh, two different uh, grassroots organizations, ARPA proposals that Sean will have later today, which totals six point five seven, eight, nine, almost $9 million between the two of them. Um, and then under the new initiatives, the only thing that I put in, I guess that first bucket was uh, Ms. Johnson's request for additional uh, research policy position for the city council. And then uh, there's nothing else that has a dollar associated with it, with the exception of the digital divide initiative which I did not put in, the, in this early bucket. But again, um, the digital divide initiative, I, I would say the same thing. Uh, are there opportunities in terms of some of our ARPA funds, whether it is a jobs and workforce development or housing? So uh, and I know it took a long way to just basically say there, everything's in it except for three, four, sixteen. Okay, so that, if you want to keep a running tally, it's on that sources available page in the document. So um, hearing no further questions, the comment or the request from Mr. Bakari is that if there is six votes or more for any one item, that that and gives the manager the ability to include it in the upcoming budget for as an adjustment. So. Um, I don't, do I need a motion for that? Or it's a kind of a rule? No, just want to have. I want to make sure there's, 
I would make sure there's clarity among the council, uh, and that can be done through a motion or everyone bo not bobbing their head up and down. I'll yes. move to make a formal motion to see if we have it here to adopt uh, number one under employee pay into but the, the budget. The cool question is whether we're no, adhering to the question. process you suggested. The process. <laughs> the process about six votes today allowing the manager to go ahead and not yeah. uh, if it's not a deal. motion it's go, if it's a head nod it's just moving yes, forward as a straw vote if it's a motion it gets six votes then we lock it in yeah. I know but that's not we're going to do that for the remainder of it's the, the process. it's just the oh. process we're going to oh, do this bad. for the process right. yeah. just raise your hands if you're in favor of this process yes. let's go Come on. All right. let's get a start all right so now do I have a motion? I would move that number one is adopted. Second. In the budget. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. aye. Raise your hands. Anyone opposed? Anyone opposed? Okay. And she had a discussion. She has questions. Oh, you had a question. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. No, you're okay. Forgive me if it's redundant. What the mayor pro tem suggested earlier, separate and apart from this? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. So. I just want to make sure, Ms. Watlington, you were a yes on that vote. Okay, so. Move to adopt number two. Move to adopt right. number two into the budget. All right, the next item is a motion to adjust for the lowest paid hourly employees. Um, uh, can I actually change that? At the advice of my very smart colleague. Uh, move to adopt all except for three, four, and 16, which we'll come back to. Oh my gosh, three, this would be awesome. Except three, four. <laughs> and 16. And 16? Where's six, where six? Oh, 16. Oh, you're making, you're making the, the These are the ones bit. the manager just said. Are, okay. If we do them, there has to be reprioritization in the budget versus the ones that are not listed there either are not budgetary items that have impact. Actually, let me rephrase can, that. Can we Move just, to adopt all except three, four, 16, as well as any that are not budgetary impacts that have an I, NA or a TBD. I, wait, wait, I, I just want to say something. When you adopt seven, all the financial partners, that includes the process that Sean Heath is going to present to you in a few minutes. The manager quickly summarized it, but I want to make sure everybody's clear on it. Let, let, me, let okay. me rephrase so I can chunk this. Maybe this will be easier. <laughs> Under employee pay, yeah. move to adopt all of one through six except three or four. And then we'll and, do that for each section. Yes. Okay. So we have adoption second. and we have a motion and a, sec a second for the employee pay with all those items. Hey, One, Mayor. two. Sorry, I just. I'm, oh. and, but I do think we have to remember that you have two others that the Mayor Pro Tem has suggested as well. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure that that's included. We didn't give them a number? Not included. No. Right all now. right, included. not included. Okay. I, I just, I know I'm Mr. taking this backwards, but I just want to be clear that on number five, as we put in the write-up, um, it sounds like maybe we just need a process change. Um, we, have, we have a limitation legally on what we can do. We can go up to that point, which isn't a budget issue, but I just wanted to call that out as that's not really a change that we're making. As, uh, Yes, I read that was in your your materials that that's really a federal guideline thing. Right, and it uh, sounds like the question may be a little bit different as Council Member Bakari mentioned to me, and we'll look into that, and it's just a, a process thing, not a budget thing. So that, we're not going to be able to solve that now, so I'll right. re rephrase it again. One, two, and six. That's a question. I, I, let me get the motion on the floor first, okay? Let, this, right. All right, Mr. Bakari just made a motion to recommend moving forward item one three hundred and thirty thousand dollars item two five hundred sixty eight thousand one hundred and seventy eight dollars um six two hundred and twelve dollars and five five hundred and fifty eight seconds right we have a motion and a second for those items now any for i'm all right madam clerk yes i'm just a little confused because we we've had two motions and then a lot of people have seconded it, so I don't really. Um, I think that, that we, yeah. we, we, have, we have one, item one is done, and you have someone that made the motion, second, it was unanimous, right? You got that one? All right, now we're on two. And six. And six. Mr. Bakari made the motion 
Um, I Ms. Think Anderson Ms. seconded on that one. Anderson made a second, and now it's open for discussion. Any further discussion? Hearing no further discussion, all in favor, please raise your hands. Anyone opposed? All right, that's <laughs> unanimous. Okay, so that takes us up to the items that were. We do, do, are there any further motions in this category of employee pay? Ms. Hajmira. So with item number one and two, it addresses my number three, so that can be eliminated. Okay. Any other actions on this category of employee pay? Um, Ms. Johnson. I wanted to know the difference between Ashmere's number two and council member Mayfield number four. Yeah, so, so the difference is uh, number two is the plan that I had mentioned after your guys' feedback at budget adjustments to guarantee that all hourly employees get at least $3,600 in raises throughout the year and then bring up our floor up to 56200 for um, hourly employees. Council Member Mayfield had asked what the cost would be to bring the floor up to 50000 for employees. And so it's about $3 million more expensive. I'm sorry. So is the floor 56,200 or 50,000? Sorry, can you say that again? I thought he said 56,200. Is it 56,200 or 46? 46,200. Okay. Okay. So the next category, yeah. Ms. Mayfield? Following up on Councilmember Johnson, because you did just throw out two different numbers. So for clarification, and it may have been just when you were saying it, you just transposed it when you said it. So the difference between my question of what would it take to get us to that 50, you came back, you gave us a breakdown, said it would cost additionally another $3 million. And what was recommended in item number two, the adjustment for the lowest pay hourly employees. First of all, we had we started that many years ago where we were getting people up. The cost of living is still growing faster. So in this 568, 178 dollar amount as that we've identified for the cost, we have that as the starting salary of the 46,200? Correct. So the, the starting salary by January would be 46,200 would be the lowest paid hourly employee. And that is utilizing your recommendation of the, what was that, 3,600? 3,600 That guaranteed. was split up. Yep. Okay. So in actuality, Councilmember Johnson, I think what, we, what you were saying is accurate, that number two and my number four, the numbers that they were given was answering the same question. So in essence, it did go up from the initial 42,000 that was proposed, which is why I asked about up to 50, and it is being increased up to the 46,200. Thank you. All right. So the next category I want to go to, which before, I hope, I'm sorry, before I'm sorry, we move. Uh, so Mr. Bergman, what would be the, because we are trying to track down some some items on number five. Is, is there something to do right now that would make sense? I don't want to slow us down, but I also don't want to lose track of the of the the non-expiring buckets. So is there? Uh, so I've put it out there to try to get some answers for you. Um, I don't think there's anything you can do right now. Okay. Maybe we just at the end circle back if you've got more clarity. Yeah. This is not a budget item, as I understand, but process. But certainly one of the things that are process-wise, something with it. So we can go keep keep going. Okay. So why don't we go to new initiatives and enhancement? Um, there are four categ four requests in there, and the first one, the manager has um, said item 13 to add the research and policy position. Is there a motion to? 
approve item 13. Hey, hey Mayor. Mm -hmm. uh, just, just so we don't go sideways with sources here. Um, as the manager mentioned, we'd be within spitting distance, I think were his words. Mm -hmm. um, we'd be around, there, there's about 97,000 left of the sources based on what you already said. Um, in actuality, the way these things typically work where you have to, uh, it takes a while to actually get somebody in the door, it'll likely work itself out. So I would ask then the easiest thing would just adjust the motion to the sources left, which would be around 97,000, and I think we would be able to implement. All right. So um, now with the caveat that the staff will work with adding the research position to fit the $97,000 um, first year cost will be, is, do I have a motion? Motion to approve item second. number 13. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Madam Mayor. Ms. Sanderson. So well, specifically what we talked about a lot of different things as it relates to this line item. If, if there are additional uh, community constituent support, if it's an actual research role, specifically what are we voting yes for? What type of role or roles is this? So I'll start off with the type of resource that um, we believe we're providing with this recommendation. So uh, I have in my office an A2CM. And so with the A2CMs, um, you've seen uh, Julia Martin, right? And Emily uh, Kunze. So we're looking at that level of uh, expertise. Now how you utilize it, but that the person, that is how we would structure the recruitment for that position. And I think you've worked with both of them and they are <coughs> top notch. I, I think that at some point perhaps this goes into the governance committee of how the actual time would be utilized and shared and have some council discussion and the council decides. So may I have a clarifying mm -hmm. question? So Mr. Manager, are you saying that this will be an additional person in your, in your office under your team framework or is this an additional person for the council members since council members if I recall when council member Johnson was first introducing this it was in regards to the fact of the current body and how we share staff resources so your interpretation of this position would land where in the office of constituent services thank you Ms. Watlington, followed by Mr. Driggs. Um, I think, based on the questions that I'm hearing, coupled with whether or not this gets approved, there seems to be a need to conduct some kind of org model to really <coughs> understand how to best utilize yes. the OCS resources and how this position would best function there. Um, so. I'm supportive of this with the understanding that there's going to be some additional org work to support whatever the best utilization of this budget item is. Yeah. Yes, I think that what I had suggested is that Ms. Edgemere with governance look at it and help figure out what the council wants and expects and come to a conclusion and then that would actually, I would want my description written before I started to take a job and so I think having this if it's approved in the budget then I think that it's really important that council um, comes together and makes a decision around mm -hmm. the work that's going to be done and how it will be done and it will be in the office of constituency service okay so to be clear what I'm talking about is broader than just this one assignment because what I'm saying is there are so many people in OCS right now right mm -hmm. I think that if we're going to add a person to that now is a great time to say, let's take a look at how we're organizing, what the job descriptions are for all of those roles so that we can figure out what the best use of this additional head is. Yeah, I, I get that. I just thought that this one was research-based, and That's so that was really important. And I, But I think at any point, if you want to review the office and how it's modeled and done, I think there's opportunities to do that. Yes, thank you, Mayor. So um, to your question, uh, Jason, and Renee are going to reach out to all of you as it relates to the level of service that you believe that you need and expectations of what I would say 
um, what is a baseline of what you should be getting from the Office of Constituent Services. Yeah, because it may be that there's positions. A, yeah, okay. Because okay. what I'm saying is this may not end up just being one research person split amongst 11 people. It right. may be, okay. And Madam Mayor, that was getting to the root of my question is if we don't have any organizational development relative to this role and to the entire team, we're bringing on one resource to support 11 people without any way to balance workload um, and throughput of projects, et cetera. So I'm, I'm certainly supportive of us uh, receiving additional resource, but I want us to be thoughtful about what that, how that resource will plug into an optimized organizational model. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm sorry, Ms. Johnson? Ms. Johnson? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh -huh. So I just want to clarify, um, right now council shares an admin person. We all know that we share, an ad, we share an admin person among two people. So we've got two people that help with our emails and scheduling. And um, this, is, this would be, um, I mean, it, I, I think we should start with at least one person to help us with the higher level work. I, I think we all agree that we need that. Um, if it's research regarding rezonings or uh, research regarding history of uh, policies or something, but uh, that's what I'm asking for is, uh, like you said, Mr. Jones, someone like a Julia Martin or someone like that, that we would have as a support person um, for council. And I know I worked with Marcus during all, with all of the rezonings in the Mallard Creek area. It's just a lot of work that, that escalates to a higher level than what our admin staff um, is responsible for. So uh, I, I think we should, we should start with at least one person. Um, if you all advocate for more, but we certainly need um, more staff so that we can give our constituents the best service, the best responsive, the responses and, 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 and timely responses. And, and this is a part-time position. We all know that. And this is just support for the citizens of, of the city. Thank you. All right. All right, so and Mr. Driggs. So uh, the way we are organized, the manager reports to us and is responsible for staffing, organization, and for delivery of service. <clears throat> My concern here is that uh, we are, we're getting the, the cart before the horse. The way this ought to work is the case is made to the manager that there is this need. The manager, based on his responsibility for staffing and organization, agrees and then brings to us from him in his budget this recommendation. So, uh, and, and certainly given my own uh, so far uncertainty, I would suggest that if this is going to move forward, it be subject to a subsequent council vote on the exact role and organization and use of these funds. I, I don't think we're clear enough on what this money would be used for, and therefore, you know, fine, if you want to go ahead and set it aside, have it available, and let's find out more about how it's going to be used and reserve the option to just release it again if, it, if we don't reach a consensus. because. Uh, I really think that you set a bad precedent in terms of holding the manager accountable when we start to inject ourselves into staffing decisions. Thank you. So I, I hear a number of different ways to approach this. I think I just want to make sure that the manager has said that he takes the responsibility for review in the Office of Constituent Services. He also recommends that this position be included in the, or is, accepts that this position is included in the budget. And Mr. Driggs, I think that it would still fall under the purview of what the charter says that they, you know, all employees have to go through the manager's process. That's just to protect all of us. So I, I just want to hear the manager recommend this and, and not have us make this decision and him say, okay, I, I can deal with that. It's not my idea. So thank you, Councilmember Driggs. So we've had, um, so I'm I am supportive. Okay. Yeah, we we've uh, tried this over the the, the years, and uh, for instance, I think maybe three or four budgets ago, we added additional 
staff to the budget office, somebody who could help Marie so that when the, as she, as she sneaks out, somebody who, who could help Marie as questions came up from council that they could do some of the policy analysis. I, I will tell you, it would be very important to uh, survey all of you about how you think you would utilize the position because I think you guys, you may be thinking about it differently amongst yourselves. But to have a resource for you that's a higher level part of analysis within the offices of constituent services makes a lot of sense. Okay, thank you. Ms. Molina. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. I, uh, not to belabor the point of my colleagues, but I have been under um, the opinion since I entered this office that we really don't have sufficient bandwidth to do this job. Um, as our city has grown, what I know that I've experienced personally is that there's a lot of work for one person and for the amount of support that we have, um, I feel like it's not really reflective of the size organization that we are as a city. So what I would personally like for us to do, I, I don't disagree with us having this additional resource specifically for this, um, but I, I just, I would like to see us have a full scale dis discussion around exactly what you're saying, Mr. Manager, around, you know, how can we have, you know, the best resources for support to effectively do this job, especially from a, um, from a district representative point of view, because, you know, there's a specific detail that goes into, you know, what that job, you know, represents for the people that we serve. So um, I'm, I'm absolutely in support of what you're saying and, you know, kind of um, asking the questions to my colleagues and myself and seeing what we think, you know, collectively would be the best way to, you know, offer that support. But I want to make sure that I clarify with this particular vote, is this saying that we're going to wait until you, you know, define what that means or are we just going to vote to say that this one thing specifically is what we're going to do? I'm trying to make sure that I understand what sure. we're doing. So uh, when you vote on this, we will load it in the budget in such a way that you could hire the position immediately. And so um, even after today, if it gets the, the nod to go forward, we'll start talking with you about what you think that should be. But to the mayor's point, you know, maybe even a discussion at a committee would probably be better than just having some surveys because I do talk to all of you and I do believe you have different thoughts about how you would utilize this position. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Okay, so I'm not quite sure if I even remember who made the motion. Um, so, but we do have a motion on the floor. Do, Madam Clerk, can you tell me who made the motion? Mrs. Um, Johnson. Renee Ms. Johnson. Johnson made the motion and it was second. I think it was Mayfield, but I Ms. Mayfield seconded it. And so all in favor, you've heard the discussion and the next steps from the manager. All in favor of this um, $97,000 for that position to start within the council um, focus areas or areas of focus for the council. Um, all in favor, please raise your hand. Anyone opposed? Okay. So now this takes us to the financial partners. And before, I don't know how many people heard that Sean is going to give us two presentations on two funds that would use ARPA funding. Mr. Jones, do you have anything to add before he starts? Uh, no, Mayor. What, what I would say is um, right now, based on what you've done, we're still within that $1.2 million. And as I mentioned earlier, I, I would recommend that the financial partners, however you go about um, approving it or moving them forward, would come out of these two ARPA buckets that Sean would have presented at five, but maybe it makes sense to it talk about It would make a lot of now. sense to get it done now <laughs> because it's really related to this entire section. So. Sean, thank you. Point of clarification, we have now allocated all of the 1.2, is that correct? Correct. 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 So that's now done, that part. Correct. So anything we do beyond that with OPEX is now has to be reprioritized with something else other than ARPA. Sure. Okay. Sure. With that said, uh, 
The only other number that's here that has a, a number attached to it is something, Mayor Pro Tem, that you brought up, dealing with the digital divide. And I, I think you may recall we had $10 million allocated. There's still funds that um, have not uh, been expended. So I don't want to ignore item 16. We did start off with additional um, positions in there. And if there's something that goes beyond what we've done, I'm again open to that discussion and, and I'm thinking out loud, is there an opportunity maybe even to do something out of um, some of the remaining ARPA funds if it relates to some of the, I think there are three items and one deals with community engagement. But I, I just didn't want to jump to the financial partners mayor without resolving the mayor for Tim's last item that has the last item that has a number attached to it. I'm sorry, I didn't have that one checked on my list. So my apologies, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, so the manager said that the funds of 1.2, we're going to hear from Mr. Heath the two options for funding of financial partners and housing and other areas. And then do we come, we'll come back to the digital divide and before we move on. Thank okay. Thank you. Let's go. Thank you. I was Mr. Hope. Mayor. Who is that? Miss oh, Mayfield. Miss Mayfield. Oh, we did. I have a question for Mr. Heath before she starts. Perfect, because I think we're waiting to load the slides. Right. I'm ready. Okay. So when as you're getting ready to go through this presentation with us, Mr. Heath, are you going to also be giving us a update of what we look for in partners because I'm looking through the financial partners there seem to be a number of requests that are employee overhead requests versus operations requests we've had conversations throughout the years you got to have the staff person in order to actually implement the program but I believe years ago we had a ratio for any ask or we had a separate way of looking at it if it was basically asking for the assistance for salaries versus hoping to fund the individual and the programming that they were provided. So it will be helpful of when you're going through this if you can touch on that so that we're all on the same page. Understood. We'll do. Thank you. Oh, I'll say again. Okay, great. Thanks. So this is part one of a two part presentation this evening. And the good news is there are only a few slides on part one and there are only a few slides on part two as well. So I'm going to jump straight into it because the city manager already set the foundation. These are the two programs that he's made reference to already this afternoon. One is referred to as community resilience grants, which is in the middle row. And the second on the far right are the housing support grants. So and I'll take these one by one. The distinction here is Last year, last calendar year, City Council already approved what we're now referring to as the Community Resilience Grants. So we've given it a brand name. But there was a request for council action in calendar year 2022 uh, requesting that we have support to move forward with a nonprofit operating grant program. So the elements that you see here in this middle row have already been vetted with council and approved, even the specific investment priority areas. and the um, notion that this would be focused, Councilmember Mayfield, to your point, on general operating support. So in the CARES Act, we did something similar with a $2 million program that was dispersed to about 20 nonprofit organizations. The grants ranged anywhere from $10,000 to $225,000. And we used the same investment focus areas, housing and neighborhoods, equity and inclusion, and environment and sustainability. So this program was stood up on Thursday of last week. Tomorrow, I'll provide a note to council that, so you've already been given some baseline information about the program, but the note I send you tomorrow will have a link to the portal so you can feel free to share this with your network partners in the nonprofit community. So it's two and a half million dollars. I would expect we would award it to at least 20 recipients, if, if not two dozen or so. In on June 1st, we will be holding a virtual information session for any nonprofits that are interested in speaking directly with city staff to better understand what we're looking for in the grant applications. And the grant applications will be accepted through June 30th. So on general operating support here, Councilmember Mayfield, 
really, so this is not a first come first serve kind of a program. Um, so we'll have a scoring rubric and we'll be interested in the degree of focus that these nonprofit organizations have on these three investment priority areas, which by design are meant to be fairly broad. And then also the degree to which they can demonstrate things such as the extent to which their programming focuses on communities and or populations that were directly impacted or disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, because that's the way for this particular program that we tie back into ARPA compliance considerations. One thing that I would mention here on this one is in the discussions with council last year and in the RCA itself, we were very explicit that 30% of this overall grant of this overall program of two and a half million dollars will be devoted to what we're referring to as small grassroots nonprofit organizations. And we're defining that as organizations with an operating budget of $250,000 or less. So this was, we're going back in time a ways, but this was based on feedback that we had received that the smaller the, the nonprofit organization, the harder it was for them to demonstrate to the city that they should be funded. So we wanted to, with a equity and grant making lens, make an attempt here to be really intentional about carving out a specific amount just for the grassroots nonprofit community. So I'm gonna to pivot to the housing support grants. I'll provide a little more information on, yeah, please. But okay, okay, great. So whereas the community resilience grants have already been vetted and approved by council and, and just launched last Thursday, the housing support grants as the city manager referenced, this is a new idea, it's something we've been working on for the last couple of months based on some community conversations that we've had. And the quick backstory here is, if you think about over the last few years, what we've done with CARES Act funding and ARPA funding and housing trust fund resources as it relates to housing and homelessness related investments, the vast majority of our investments have focused on large nonprofit organizations or for-profit developers. And these are great partners, so I'm not in any way suggesting that those were poor choices. But along the way, we've had a number of conversations with medium-sized emerging organizations, um, some of which that really came about during the pandemic. And we believe they're doing good work. And we believe with the ARPA funds that are available, it's an opportunity for the city to support them as they seek to attract funding to scale their operations. So what's contemplated here is, and we've intentionally left some of this a little bit open-ended because I'll get to the punchline here in a second, which is we'd like to release an RFP very soon in order to have the market respond with their best ideas. So we've tried not to be overly prescriptive with this at the outset. So the idea would be up to six and a half million dollars of the remaining ARPA. The manager referred to, if you assume the $4.2 million for property tax relief that was reflected in the manager's recommended budget um, is included in the adopted budget, then there's $17 million of housing related ARPA that's remaining. That's where this $6.5 million would come from. Is that available balance? The idea here, and this is a big distinction between this potential program and the one that I just discussed, whereas the community resilience grants would, relative, would generally be relatively modest sized grants, you know, average 100,000 or so, spread across dozens of recipients. Here the idea would be to identify a smaller pool of recipients that would each be eligible to receive uh, a larger amount of funding. In terms of investment focus areas, housing security and stability, which is, is aligned well with what the county actually did a few months ago when they were working through their second tranche of ARPA and ultimately awarded $99 million to a whole range of investment priority areas, including housing and homelessness as one. Here, uh, Council Member Mayfield, back to one of your questions before, unlike the community resilience grants, which are really focused on general operating support, here with housing support grants, part of the request for proposal requirements would require that they, they identify specific projects and or programming that would be funded with this, with this money. And once again, very distinct from the community resilience grants, here the grant range would be from 250,000 on the low end up to 2.5 million on the high end. And on program intent, I would just underscore that the idea would be to devote all of this funding to medium-sized and emerging nonprofits, which is a segue to the second and final slide here to give you a sense for what do we mean when we say medium size and emerging nonprofits. 
So just to take it to the next level of information on housing support grants, eligible organizations would require to be 501c3 nonprofits that reported total annual revenue less than 7.5 million and or were founded less than 10 years ago. So if a nonprofit fits into either of those buckets or both, then they would be eligible to pursue this funding. Uh, another requirement is that they have a full-time staff and an operating board of directors. The next area is something that would distinguish this in a meaningful way. In addition to being eligible, we would identify these are the types of attributes that we would look for in project proposals. So this would help us prioritize requests. And the types of things we'd be interested in would be organizations with a track record of delivering programming to minority communities. Projects or programming that are in corridors of opportunity areas of influence, which our economic development team and our data team have worked on to provide maps that are available to the general public to get a sense for what is the footprint like for the quote unquote areas of influence around corridors. Next here, uh, funds that are focused on or programming and projects that are focused on hard to house populations such as formerly incarcerated, homeless families, households with rental subsidies, and then finally, and importantly, organizations that have a track record of doing more than just the housing work or the homeless work, which is, which is certainly important, but also incorporating wraparound services and support services into that type of programming. So it wouldn't be necessary for an application to contain all of those attributes, but the more attributes that are reflected in the presentation, the stronger the proposal is, and it would give us a way to evaluate the request that we receive. In terms of two other considerations, as I mentioned before, we believe the best approach to ensure this is a fair and open process is to go through a formal RFP. We uh, would be motivated to do this as quickly as possible in terms of getting the RFP constructed out into the marketplace, receive responses, and then whichever ones were the most compelling, bring those back into council and seeking your approval for us to make those funding decisions. The last thing I would mention, something that we, the staff has spoken with council a, a fair amount about over the last year or so, is this idea of capacity building and what are things that we could do to enhance capabilities for the nonprofits that we're providing funding to. And I'm not in a position to make a commitment today, but I would say we're on the front end of having some really good conversations with the national organization that basically provides a turnkey capacity building solution. And what I like about it is you can sign up for a cohort of 25 or 50 or 75 nonprofit organizations. And among other things, the participating nonprofits have one-on-one -on -one access to experts in areas like fundraising, strategic planning, measurement and evaluation, compliance and back office work. So what I'd like to do, if we can pull this off, is in tandem to working on the RFP, continuing to tease that out and, and try to have that in place. So if and when funds are awarded under this concept, that in addition, in addition to the money, they would also be able to opt into this capacity building program. So that was kind of a, a whirlwind tour of both of those. I'll stop now and answer any questions. All right, I see a number will just come around. We'll start with Ms. Watlington, followed by Ms. Anderson. Okay, no problem. Ms. Anderson, followed by Mr. Graham. All right. Uh, Sean, thank you for this information. And, and I think in particular, uh, this area of focus is critical to our community. But um, the timeline that you mentioned, can you just give us a T-shirt size of how soon you would like to kick this RFP out, uh, out to the community and when those dollars would actually be able to hit the community? Absolutely. So I'm, I'm laughing to myself because I know my staff is listening very intently to this. Right now. So uh, we're motivated to move fast. Um, I think, you know, let's assume it takes a couple of weeks to structure the RFP, get comfortable that we've got, um, you know, the right document ready to go. And then I think that we would want to have it open for at least four weeks because I think if you do it less than four weeks, kind of, you kind of do a disservice to the community. Uh, you know, some of the organizations may be ready to move with the proposal immediately, but others, I think we want to give them an ample amount of time to pull it together and get a really strong proposal in. So if it's a couple of weeks to develop it, let's say it's, it's four to six weeks at the very most, 
uh, in order for them to get the applications in. Once we receive the applications, uh, we could make it a priority and we could be ready to talk about recommendations within, let's say, three weeks from there. Okay, so by the end of the summer. Yeah, that's, yeah, clearly. Agreed. Yep. Yeah. Okay, and then on page, um, what page is this? The, the summary of the adjustments, page three, where we have our financial partners listed seven through 12. Is it, am I right in understanding that these financial partner requests would come out of <coughs> the $6.5 million of the ARPA bucket? It so, would be a mix. So I'll help you, Sean. Right. Okay. <laughs> because I, like, I guess I got you in the space, okay? <laughs> so I, I guess uh, two pieces. And Sean, I want to call it the, the right term. The 2.5 million is called what again? Community Resilience Grants. Okay, Community Resilience. So the Community Resilience Grants, you've set aside 30% of it for... Um, the annual operating budget. Okay, and then the rest of it's open to... the. the okay, so ha having said that, um, the way that I see it, and Sean, you correct me, number seven, eight, nine... I'm sorry, number seven, nine, 10, 11, and 12 would be eligible for that $2.5 million pot. Gotcha. Item eight, correct, would be, from what I know, would be eligible for, for the pot that Sean's talking about now, the 6.5 million. Is that correct, Sean? Yes, it is. Okay. Yes, it is. Okay, uh, okay, great. And one last question. The you mentioned that we have 17 million related um, ARPA funds related to housing left, and so if we were to go through an RFP process with this 6.5 million, will we still have 11.5 million left to take action on? 10.5. 10.5. Okay. Don't carry the one. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. Mr. Graham. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So let me start by under, uh, underscoring I understand process <laughs> and, and I respect process. Um, but <laughs> if these items were included in the budget, the funds would be available July 1st. All right? Well, not all of them because well, if, uh, they're, uh, sometimes thereafter, after all the due diligence were done. So, um, to your point, Mr. Graham, if the funding was in the budget and there were earmarked specifically for these organizations, the money would be available shortly after July 1st. If the funding is in the budget to set up a, a process, it would be no different than, than this. And Mr. Graham, if I could just make sure I was clear, and, and I'd like to also publicly thank uh, Rebecca Hefner and Lacey Williams for really pulling this together um, in a great way in a fairly short order here. With the applications due on June 30th for the Community Resilience Grants, we'd be in a position in July to make pretty quick decisions on those. It was the other one that Councilmember Anderson was referring to on the Housing Support Grants, where we're going to need a little more time with that one because we haven't released the MP for it yet. And if it was in the that process, they will be eligible for consideration. Correct. No guarantee. Correct. That they will be awarded. Correct. And if they were embedded in the budget, they would be awarded. So I understand process. I, 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 I respect it. And I think we need to have good processes around, around the dice in terms of decisions that we're making. Uh, I also understand the need of small nonprofit organizations that are doing work in our community that no one ever sees, um, feels, or touch other than the people that they're helping. And, um, you know, I, um, I, I just think that um, um, creating hurdles um, and having these organizations compete against others, because anybody in the community that's have a nonprofit can compete, um, um, takes away what I think um, what many of us who are district representatives see and feel in touch while we're in the community in terms of understanding who's doing the, the much needed work. 
right, and taking that away from council and giving it to the staff through a process where I may go the whole year uh, and I don't make a big deal about it, but mm -hmm. understanding what's happening in the streets relating to homelessness, and I go out there time and time and time and time again to see the same organization doing the work. I, I, I just think there's some consideration of being decisive and, and, and having council members having the opportunity to kind of say, hey, we recognize the need, we, we recognize who's doing the work, uh, the work is valued, these individuals meet whatever criteria that staff has put in place for them to be considered for uh, receiving public funding uh, to get those funding to them sooner than later. I, I would do it differently, but I'm, I'm, I just represent one vote. Thank you. So thank you, Councilmember Graham. <clears throat> uh, when we mentioned the 10.5 million that's still remaining in the ARPA bucket, these are financial partners with the exception of number eight that would be eligible for the community resilience grants. I think totals about $605,000 on the low end and 1,005,000 on the high end. I do believe that if they were eligible for this process and if it's the will of council to take out $605,000 out of the ARPA bucket or $1 million out of that remaining 10.5, um, clearly that was is within the purview of council if that's what you'd like to do. Okay. The only, the only comment that I had is um, on the qualifications. I think we still need a little bit of, even if it's like brown paper bag financials for some of these. I, I, we have gone through some struggles sometimes when we didn't have the um, background for the financials. And I'm not saying that they have to have an audit or anything, I'm tr no hurdles like that. But I do think that we ought to have some requirements for both um, what, if it's just the bank account. I think there ought to be some requirements as well for the opportunity to come in. And I like the capacity building side of that. It's really, really helpful because I think that that will be a contributor to building and growing the organizations, um, especially those that are focused on some of the work that we're doing around the city that's so necessary. So those would be my comments. So uh, Ms. Ashmira, do you have any comments? Um, <clears throat> so thank you, Madam Mayor. I have a couple of things that I just want to add. Um, I agree with some of the comments that were made by Ms. Anderson. Uh, I mean, all these organizations that we talked about at our last meeting, uh, they all do great work. Um, I see Brother Reggie's here from the Mills Place and so many other organizations. Um, and in terms of this process that Mr. Heath outlined, I think it gives all the organizations, including the ones that are listed here, a fair opportunity to apply and, uh, and, and get a lot more funding than it's currently allocated. Because I see uh, there was 50,000 for Carolina Metro Reds, Block Love for 230, 100 to 400 for the Mills Place, but I do not want to limit those funds just to what's listed. I think if we go through that process, if, if we let the process uh, takes place, I think they could potentially get, get uh, additional funds. So um, I, I would just like, you know, that's where I'm torn, but that's all I have to say. Thank you. All right. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Um, no, I, I think this is, this is good. Um, and it's responsive um, to I know some of the uh, difficulties I've had with some decisions that we've made in the past, especially when it comes to finding ways to support folks that are um, doing the work on housing folks that are that, that we find difficult to serve. Um, I, I would 
you know, like to, you know, I don't, I don't want to speak directly to, to uh, Mr. Graham, but I, I think he brings up a good good point. But it's a it's one of the the things that um, I think we all sometimes struggle with um, in this position. I, I think we work at our best when city council deals with policy, so that is repeatable um, in all corners of um, the city. Um, that it is repeatable after um, we may leave this dais. Um, and it is when we deal with policy, what we can do, we have the opportunity to um, adjust the wording. We have the ability to adjust um, how the community, uh, the expectations we have for how the community can and should be able to interact with said policy. So um, uh, adopting something like this um, uh, gives um, not just the people that we decide, yeah. you know, are sitting around this dais, the ability to partake um, and, 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 and be invested in by us, um, but it, it, it provides, um, you know, the opportunity for all those folks that are watching um, and, and don't, uh, don't necessarily know us, the, yeah. the 12 of us um, right now, and I, you know. So um, I, we should, every opportunity that we have to uh, have our desires, have our prerogatives written down into policy, we should. And I think this is what I'm seeing staff being responsive to, um, and I appreciate it, um, and I look forward to um, support in this kind of pathway. Thank you. Ms. Mayfield. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you for the presentation, Mr. Heath. I have a couple of questions for you. You did respond to my question four on page 22, and that is that I was asking if the city, ha city had a three-year window for financial partners, which was something that was discussed many years ago. You identified that that was regulated to the out-of-school time program that we had, not the full financial partners, because personally, I'm not a fan of having a long-term financial commitment because I feel like organizations, whether that's a three to five-year or five-year window, should be able to have enough time to build up for other funding. I do notice that you responded that as of fiscal year 2022, partners providing out of school time services are considered within the same process as other discretionary general fund financial partners and two of the partners are currently recommended as part of the discretionary financial partner process. So as we're talking about these dis potential discretionary funds, mm -hmm. under this new model that was recommended today when we look at Community Resilient Grant, would an organization be able to apply for both, for both the Community Resilient, since that's really for programming, so that's to help with staff, which is needed, would they be able to apply for that as well as apply for the RFP process if they're under that $7.5 million revenue? Yes, they sure would. Okay. The other question for clarification, because I would hope that the focus is more on our smaller organizations, because we have a lot of larger partners that are much closer to that $7.5 million budget that very well could also apply. What outside of the general outline that you shared with us, do we have any safeguards in place to try to keep the funding as close to the community and the work as possible? Because unfortunately, we have had opportunities where individuals not from this community have gone in and sat at the feet of organizations that have been doing amazing work, but have never necessarily been funded through government dollars, whether city or county, and then come and do this great presentation based off of the work of an ongoing organization, and then we fund it, and they're not successful. So have we considered, and when I'm asking consideration, talking to those community leaders and organizations to try to come up with ideas for safeguards around that? I appreciate the question, and it's something that we certainly grappled with as we were teasing this out. And we're trying to find that sweet spot because we didn't want the number to be too small, because we do want to find an opportunity with this program 
to do meaningful things with a relatively small number of grants for these organizations that have proven that they're ready. Um, so if we set that threshold too small, I would worry, for example, if we were to give a two and a half million dollar grant to an organization with a $750,000 operating budget, you know, at some point that equation doesn't work and you, you get concerned that they won't be able to handle that level of funding. So I don't have a direct answer to your question other than to say we've been sensitive about that as we were developing this. It's the sort of thing that we would consider in our evaluation process. Um, finding that threshold level is more of an art than a science because if the question were asked, well, how did you get to 7.5, we sat around and we, and we thought about it, we talked about it, and we felt like that was an appropriate threshold based on a review of the operating revenue for the large players that we typically work with who are above that threshold and the medium-sized players that we haven't really done much funding with who are below that threshold. So we felt like it was striking a, a reasonable balance. So for the 200, the maximum of the 250, if we're looking at this breakdown of that being, again, the Community Resilience Grant, that is, you're saying that that can be used both for staff as well as programming or the focus should be programming? Yes, on the Community Resilience Grant, so, um, you know, ARPA has a lot of rules, but it's very clear in assistance for nonprofits that you can provide general operating support that's not attached to a specific program. So generate general operating support will help them pay the bills, salaries, you know, utilities, whatever the case may be. And yes, one entity could apply for both of these programs, and they would be evaluated independently. Okay, so they can apply, say, for the up to 250, and then under the housing support grants for the actual programming, exactly. say they have a program and they have the proven track record is $425,000. Yes. Even though we're saying between that five to 6.5, that very well can, they can apply through the RFP process, yes. so we very well can have more than three to seven grants in there if we, if they have the capability and if they're not coming in and everyone's not asking for a million or two million. Yes, yeah, we won't know until we put it out there. Yeah, correct. Thank you for the clarification. Sure. Thank you, Madam, Madam Mayor. Sean, is this a multi-year grant? So I, I, I assume you're referring to the housing support grants? Yes, yes. Yeah. So we ha with ARPA, we can obligate funds through the end of 2024, and funds have to be expended by the end of 2026. And I, th I think we would want to mirror some of those timelines in our contracts, but we recognize that for these medium-sized organizations, that you know, they may not be able to have a spend rate where they could spend through all of that in a 12-month period. So we would work through that in the contracting period um, if that's answering your question. It could be spent over multiple years would be, would be a more direct answer to your question. Okay, so the, the money would be given up front and then they would have multiple years to spend it instead my, of? My sense is that not all, you know, oftentimes we'll do reimbursement kind of programs, mm -hmm. but in conversations that I've had with folks in the community, I have a better recognition for how you know, once again, equity and grant making, if we do a purely reimbursement basis model for these small emerging nonprofits, it's very challenging for them. So um, I think we would try to find a way, we would find a way to kind of meet them in the middle, so to speak, and, and release some of the funding up front and then some of the funding along the way. Okay. So after an organization, let's say an organization is awarded $2.5 million or $2 million that must be used by 2026. In 2027, what, what would be the plan for that organization? One of the things that I didn't put on the slide, in the middle section where we talk about funding to be prioritized, one of the things I want to talk more about the team with is could we, should we build in a criteria focused on a demonstration that the organization has a sustainable plan in mind. So what happens when there's a cliff effect with our funding? If we have this injection of ARPA resources up front to support a project, what's their game plan for when our funding is exhausted and how can they kind of continue to sustain the, the program itself? So that's something that we'd likely try to find a way to work into the, to the RFP. Okay, so my concern would be 
would be that to fund them for a couple years and then in 2027 um, you know what happens I think that the staff helping them with capacity building will help them to be able to to seek other resources to um, to sustain but I would like to see that s sustainability factor incorporated um, and with when, when they're financial partners we don't have to worry about that finite period so much right like a fi like a financial partners um, some of these organizations I imagine we've been funding for years and years so does that diminish the support to the organization if we if we if we are funding them from that ARPA pot of money instead of as a financial partner I'd really have to defer to the strategy team on any financial partner questions I mean specific to this I think it would present a really meaningful opportunity for any of the recipients to to receive the funds and leverage it and the nonprofit nonprofit work as you would know um, is not easy because every year is a new year to raise money <laughs> but hopefully with funding from the city and hopefully with some capacity building programming wrapped around it it would put them in a stronger position to demonstrate to other funders that they're capable of delivering results and and, and jumpstart their their fundraising efforts so on page 23 of the packet that we received today there's a list of financial partners And, and just help me understand these financial partners are our financial partners they are not going to be required to complete the RFP is that correct yes there's a bright line between the financial partner process and both of the programs that I've shared tonight correct so on the page I guess three the organizations that council requested uh, to be funded we're asking these organizations to complete an RFP and go into the RFP pool instead of being a financial um, a guaranteed financial partner yeah, my interpretation of what I'm hearing is yes that for with the exception probably of that heel Charlotte reference which I think would be a larger request than could be accommodated in the community resilience grants that what's being suggested is since staff literally just stood up the council approved community resilience grants program why not leverage that as an opportunity for these organizations and the dozens and dozens of organizations that aren't represented in this room today that we know have an interest in demonstrating that they're worthy of receiving city funding as well and you know I support that you know I've advocated for the small grassroots organization so I get that but what is the benefit to the organization of going specifically these three organizations that that we have on our, our proposed budget um, 10 11 and 12 the Mel's Place, Carolina's Red, and Block Love. What's the benefit for them to submit an RFP versus being a financial partner? So, I'll, I'll take a first stamp, and Ryan will probably clean up for me. <laughs> so, Ms. Johnson, the, uh, Councilmember Johnson, there's a, a process for the financial partners where they get vetted, they fill out information that starts when Ryan roughly when uh, we usually release that in December and just for clarification the, the discretionary financial partners process is handled by Marie and strategy and budget and, and not Sean so out of the the six on there I think three did apply through the financial partner process and those we already do have their uh, uh, audits and financials and information like that I don't know we can we hear from one of the organizations that's in the room not unless we're going to have a public hearing in this okay I, I can reach out this to them separately I just I kind of that's what I heard mm -hmm. Councilmember Graham say if I if I heard it correctly um, I just that's the RFP process is kind of a chance that you may or may not get the RFP where the financial partners these organizations can budget uh, based on this award so um, yeah thank you 
Yes, good evening, uh, Ms. Johnson. And also to your point, um, the RFP process will allow you to vet the different, uh, what's your priority to get funded and what's your priority areas to really target and you know where we have gaps and we don't already have an existing partner. So you get the, the whole field to assess. But also you mentioned, yes, historically, you know, we don't fund financial partners one year by one year. Uh, once they're on and they've proven and they've set, set their objectives, a lot of times we fund it, but that's definitely not guaranteed by any means. So it's not like once you're a financial partner, you're always, but a lot of them, yes, we do try to continue to fund. So the three organizations that council lifted up, have any of those organizations been funded previously? So the three, the mail's place, you know, we got a, um, their proposal in your packet, they did not apply as a financial partner. The Charlotte Metro Reds applied, was, but was not recommended at this time for funding. Um, Block Love Charlotte did not apply as a financial partner. Oh, okay. um, crisis Assistance Ministry, as you know, it right. definitely did, you know. And the Hill Charlotte, I believe that's more in the housing wheelhouse. Um, and then For the Struggle did apply. So an organization like Crisis wouldn't wouldn't fall into this, no, because they're not a smaller organization. They would, we, they would continue to be financial partners, right? Yes, there's nothing contemplated here that pulls them out of the right. financial okay. partner process. Okay. She's saying, could they apply for that too? No, yeah. I wasn't. No, I wasn't. I was. Wait a minute. I just don't want to diminish the service that we're already providing to one of our financial partners by saying, you know, now apply for the RFP. So. If, if they are a guaranteed financial partner or a budgeted financial partner or however you want to term it, I don't, I don't want to move anyone from being a financial partner to having them submit an RFP. Yes, so to your point, none of the financial... The RFP, excuse me. Uh -huh. Sorry. None of the partners that were in the manager's financial... I mean, the, sorry, the financial partners that were recommended by, in the proposed 2024 budget, none of those in the recommendation, we're, we're not proposing pulling any of those from that list. Okay, and then the capacity building training that we're talking about to our uh, award recipients, we talked about that type of capacity building assistance last year or two yeah. years ago. So is that, um, is that, that process, or are we looking at capacity building specifically for our grant um, award recipients? Yes, good memory, because we, we did talk about it last year, but it was in the context of working with some community partners to design and build it and deploy it, Where, whereas this one would be a turnkey solution with a, a group that works across the country to provide this kind of capacity building service to funders. So it's, you know, the funders pay for it in order to provide, to provide the access to the small emerging nonprofit organizations that oftentimes don't have the resources to devote to the kind of capacity building. Okay. You gotta stop talking okay. This. So do we have an organization in mind for that capacity building organization or are we going to issue an RFP because there are local organizations that can provide that training or, or that service as well? Yeah, so I've, to, to date I've only had one converse, I've had a conversation with one organization in order to really vet the concept. And then based on everything that we've learned, we could test the market <laughs> and see who else could step forward and, and pick a winner. I want us to be able to get to the other three members before dinner um, for our Five o'clock, and we're gonna. I want. Does everybody know we have four? We have closed sessions tonight too, as I'm well. I'm finished. Thank so, you. So, Ms. Johnson. Okay, Mr. Uh, Mitchell. Madam Mayor, thank you. I like to make a motion as financial partners. Okay. We approve items seven, nine, ten, eleven, twelve as financial partners for a tune of six hundred and five thousand dollars. Second. From the source of. Opera funds. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm Thank sorry. you, Madam Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Madam Mayor. Nine, ten, eleven. Hold on. 12. We still have this. I, I got. I still have 
We're still coming back to you as well. Right, but I need to say this because this motion includes Carolina Metro Reds. I sit on their board, so I need to, I'm, I guess I need to request recusal. Yes. It, it is automatic. Unless you exclude that okay. from this particular motion for a separate vote. Oh, okay. Is it better than city trying to do a separate vote for Charlotte Metro Reds so she can recuse her? Herself? Her yes vote can be all but Carolina Metro okay. Reds. Okay. We just need to make sure with the clerk's office that, that she is recorded as abstaining from the vote on Carolina Reds. And you can do it all in one motion. Okay. okay. Thank you, All right, Mayor. so we have a motion on the floor. And a second. Um, and do, who second the motion? Yeah. Ms. Mayfield second. I have Ms. Molina, and Ms. Watlington um, and, and Ms. Ashmira as well. But we'll go to Ms. Molina. A discussion on this motion? Do you have you no know, discussion? Ms. Watlington, any discussion on the motion? All right, Ms. Follow up comments about the program though. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. I don't have anything on this specific motion. I did have comments on the presentation. Okay. I think that the presentation isn't in the motion since it's a financial partner. So we'll go to Ms. Ajmira for her question. So, thank you, Madam Mayor. Mr. Mitchell, what items, you said seven, nine, 10, I'm 11? sorry, yes, seven, nine, 10, 11, and 12. Okay. So pretty much all the financial partners uh, except Hill Charlotte? And Hill Charlotte have the ability to apply for the housing supportive grants. Got it, okay, thank you. All right. You're voting on the. Okay, everybody. Any other discussion on this mo motion? M Mayor Pro Tem. I just. I she. I asked her, and she did not. Ms. Molina, did I misunderstand you? Um, no. Um, or you on this motion? I, well, no, I actually, I wasn't making the motion. I, I was going to ask a question because I, um, just to kind of clarify where we were, but I, I think I understand it now. Okay, so what we have on the floor is a motion to use ARPA funding for the financial partners with the exception of Heal Charlotte to be approved as financial partners in this year's budget from that source of funding. Okay, everybody? Okay. All right, I have Mayor Pro Tem, and I can come back to you, Ms. Molina, and then Ms. Watlington. Mayor Pro Tem. So is this motion um, one-time funding, or would this be perpetual? One-time funding. Mm -hmm. All right, Ms. Molina, do you have anything? Good. All right, Ms. Watlington. No, on this motion? Okay. So, all in favor of the motion, please, any further discussion? All in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Anyone opposed? Two. All right. So, the motion passes. All right. Now, Ms. Watlington on the presentation. Oh. No, okay. um, just a couple of quick things. Um, okay, I'll start here. <laughs> it's quick. No, I think I understand uh, this one being competitive as it relates to uh, the rest of them. I did have a question, just so I'm clear. Can one application be used for all of these, or is there? How do we just not overly encumber the folks that are trying to apply? I just wanted to clarify that process question. So we won't be synced up quite enough to do a single application, mm -hmm. but we'll do everything possible to have streamlined applications okay. for the separate requests. Okay. And the only other thing I wanted to <coughs> note is just because I'm also looking at page 23 here where it talks about the UDO positions and how that will be funded basically through updates to the fees. I just want us to be, I don't want to make sure that departments are synced up because I don't want us to be investing in housing programs while simultaneously raising fees for housing development um, and, and end up hurting ourselves in the end. So if we could just do a quick check on that, um, that would be a follow-up request. Okay. All right. 
I think that concludes. Um, um, okay. Mr. Manager, is will it need to go to committee as far as being able to have the policy conversation regarding what we just approved? Because what was introduced today was the community resilience grant as well as the housing support grant. But when I'm only going to speak for my recommendation, when I made my initial recommendation, my item for 10 was a part of this general fund financial partners <clears throat> that we have. What was just introduced to us was new information as far as this general fund partners. They're not part of this new conversation. So when it was first being shared, when I asked my questions, I was under the impression that moving forward, this is how we're going to move forward. Not that these general fund partners that we currently list are basically in perpetuity, but the new members that were introduced were not introduced as part of the general fund. They're going to be introduced under housing support grants or community resilient grant. To have the policy language and the discussion, does that need to be a referral to committee so that we can get clarity and have consistency? Because I don't think any organization should be able to basically in perpetuity automatically have access to funding through this general fund list and be able to apply for these other, to these two additional funding models that were just introduced to us. So if I could capture this the right way, um, Councilmember Mayfield, I do believe there needs to be a policy discussion at some committee if the concept is um, the expectation that financial partners are short periods of time that and then you graduate out or something like that. That is not the way that the budget office has looked at these over the years. Um, so that's kind of part one. Part two, I would say that now that um, there's this opportunity to fund a number of these organizations through the ARPA funds, um, they should absolutely positively in December or November when the application comes through, apply, and it would seem that much like we did with my brother's keeper. We started off similar to what happened today. It was during the budget discussion. We started off with 25,000 or what have you, and then they applied the next year they became a financial partner. So to your first piece, we have not looked at the financial partners as three years and then out. We have looked at it longer, and if that's the discussion. So that's two separate have, conversations. One, if there's a sunset, on financial partners. Two, we have a number of organizations that are baked into our general fund. We have three organizations, and again, I'm only gonna speak for the one that I recommended, that had, a, when I made my recommendation, it was not under a new model, it was under the current model. So if we're gonna have this current model, there has to be a place for us to have conversation for clear transparency of what does this in perpetuity funding look like in comparison to the new two additional funding options and who gets access to these options. Because what we approved to move forward tonight was one time, -time funding through ARPA. Correct. Where does that sit with these others that we have in our general fund in order to have a conversation of how we move forward. Because we have limited ARPA dollars and we have a limited window for those ARPA dollars. And that was not my intention when I made my recommendation. So if we're introducing new models of funding, I think we need, whether it comes to governance and accountability for us to be able, if Madam Chair will accept that as a recommendation to the committee for us to really be able to have a chance to dig into it, we need to know what does this general fund partner mean versus housing support grants versus community resilient grant? What are these grants versus this designated line item in our general fund so that we make sure that we're addressing as many needs as possible with no one feeling like that they are, they are locked in for a guaranteed dollar amount into their budget. It needs to be transparent and as fair as possible. And if we're creating something new, which we just did, 
how does that new impact what we currently are obligated or have been obligated to for decades? We'll start off with, with a write-up for you, Councilmember Mayfield, because I think what you will find is that multiple organizations have um, had grants from multiple pot, pots what? during this ARPA and CARES three years. So let us get you some data on what this looks like, okay? But do it doesn't need to go. Do we need, can we get it sent to committee so that we can have the chance to have to ask, get the questions answered? I think it would be really appropriate to get some information and get the questions that the committee is going to address after we get that data and then make that decision around the committee because I've never heard of a policy that says you're guaranteed funding. I think that there have been some issues perhaps where crisis assistance, for example, has had air areas of focus for heating and um, things like that. So I, but I, I don't think we have any policies and I think that's a really good question to have. So I think get some data and then we can do that. Um, so I, I want to get Thank you, everyone Mayor. in because I, I'm just going to say we need a break. And we need to get lunch, dinner. I guess it's dinner now. Um, <laughs> we also need to come back. And I would say if we could, I know it's uh -huh. awkward, but I think that we still have a question to follow up on. Can Ms. Johnson, do you mind if I, we have a question that we have to ask the council members, is there anything additionally new that they would like to add as a budget ad ad adjustment tonight because that is the process that we have to follow to proceed for the adoption of the budget. So I want to just make sure that if there is a, no, an me. adjustment that if you would um, have that, do you have an adjustment, Ms. Johnson? No, I still have a question on the previous discussion. Okay, can we get, can we get the adjustment so that yes. people can get dinner? Then we can come back. So. Um, is there anyone on the council member that has an adjustment that they would like to see accomplished or re a cost analysis, co analysis written up with costs, how it would work, and additional information prior to the 25th meeting? Is there anyone that I has speak on behalf of all of us. I think the answer is no. <laughs> okay. Move to close right. budget adjustments. So, so that before would we be do that, I, I have a question. <laughs> Ms. Johnson has a question. Yes, thank you. I think what Council Member Mayfield said was very, very important. I agree. And we need clarification because I think we were all under the impression that the financial partners would come out of the general fund. It wasn't until uh, Mr. Mitchell clarified when you said from what fund, and he said ARPA, that it changed direction. I think so before you I came, was, we had a discussion about this and the manager reviewed it um, before I think you came into the room today, but I think that the manager had made a recommendation at the beginning of the meeting to do it differently from the ARPA fund. So to do the financial partners from the ARPA To do ARPA the fund. financial partners from the ARPA fund, yes. That was from the manager. Earlier in the meeting, I can read to you um, what we talked about somewhere in here in the notes, but it was at, at it was before the meeting started, and I don't think that you were here when we were when Which we had that discussion. Right. right. So, yes, I understand. Okay. All right. So it is now 5:38. Do you think we could be back in here with food? I know. Please, if you don't mind. <laughs> I Madam do Mayor, want to have a the, motion to close. Given the amount of time we have left here, should we just kind of have people go out one at a time and then just keep doing business? I was thinking business? go out and get your food and come back to the table and eat oh, at the same time. <laughs> I would like to say, I would like to have, do we need a motion to close out? Ms. Sajmira has made a motion I, well, I don't think we need that, that closes the budget adjustments, but I ha that requires a unanimous vote of the council because this is the time to close adjust adjustments yes budget adjustments. Yeah. Got right. a second all right mayor pro tem made a motion that we close the opportunity for the budget adjustments which was <laughs> the motion that mr bakari made at the beginning of the meeting but what? i think it works out well at the end of the meeting if there is anyone that would have any adjustment again let's just make sure you you're okay so all in favor that the directions from this meeting that the, have been approved and adopted by council 
the manager will prepare the 2024 budget, FY 24, 20, 2024 budget, based upon the decisions that were submitted today and approved. Do I have a motion? Yeah. So, so moved. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Any, second. Okay. Yeah, Any yeah. discussion? Yes. Uh, okay. So. Let's, I, I um, let me make sure I understand what's going on. <laughs> I can so, assure you, you don't. So the three items that are still open, are we saying? Are you saying that we're going to come back Thursday to talk about those three items, or are you saying that there is no Thursday related to this, and we start to put the budget together? That's where I think that's what we've heard. It's the ladder. The ladder. The ladder. The ladder. There, yeah. Okay. Let me just make Surprisingly. sure. Surprisingly. All right. I thought it was the ladder because when we did the first vote on the first section. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem did not get any of those um, items in under the current and the in the process. Oh, that, that we were was not for struggle. That was adjustments that are going to be researched and brought back. Well, more importantly, we've spent all the money now, so. I, I think so. <laughs> I thought you voted. I thought you voted to close out the adjustments, but if that, that's not clear to me, then help me. You want you guys to have a report. To have straw votes. You added we before that we added new adjustments that have to be researched and brought back. But you mm -hmm. went ahead with uh, the, the, what we already have researched on, which are two different. Right. That's topics. why I'm asking. Tell me if this isn't something that you want to do. It's okay. I'm just saying we can finish up or we can add more research and adjustments. So what is left at this point? I'm. I. All right. So who has an adjustment? Those two adjustments were, Those to two be, adjustments. were supposed to go yeah. and be researched and brought back. Right. Okay. Yeah, you're right. If, if there are I'm votes. That you would change your mind. No. <laughs> do we need to vote? Madam Mayor, point of clarification, do we need to vote on, on these items here yes. to move forward and advance? Oh, yes. We have search? to vote on the things that we had approved. But we already have had that vote. I believe the Madam Clerk. We did not have a vote on so the So I would make a motion to not move forth any other items and close budget adjustments for the calendar year. Second. Second. We have a second. That's changing our process, and I think the two things that would be left out, and let me be clear, is the Mayor Pro Tem's suggestion for employee compensation and the fire costs for first responder. Say that again. What, what I'm saying. This motion would mean that we would not have a report on employee compensation for 3% inflation projection that's up here and the fire service costs for first responder medical calls. So that's what this would mean. And the reason why I'm, the reason why I'm making this motion is because on the second one, this is the manager said he'd take that away. And this is more of a probably charging medic the right amount in a renegotiation. And the first one, we already all agreed upon a substantial raise that puts us in the top three in the nation of our peer group. And we don't have budget, nor is that something that I think is realistic. So that's, I, I just I, wanted to explain why, why yes, I made the motion. Yes, that was your position. So with that explanation of the position that we close off the budget adjustments, but I believe that what we had committed to earlier is that the Mayor Pro Tem would get an analysis of these mm -hmm. and that could be open for a budget adjustment. Mm -hmm. So with that, we are not going to be able to close that because that was a commitment that we made in our rules at the beginning of the meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay? All right. So we will get a report on these two. Um, but the remaining items, do I need a motion on all of the items in the various groups that it could be put up that have gotten a vote? Or do we need to do, review that? Uh, we're done. I, I think we are. I'm just making sure because I don't want us, Ms. Mayfield. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I have a question for clarification. So under new initiatives enhancements, are... Did, are we not moving forward with item 14, 15, or 17, 18? We had that, we did have that section already voted on, and the only thing that came out was item 13. So we did not. So have, we did not move forward with 14, 15, 16, correct. 17, or 18. And, and I want to make sure, Madam Clerk, you have that. I believe that that. Isn't that what happened, Ryan? We we had a motion for the new initiatives, right. and the only one that moved out was 13. That's what I wanted to yes. make sure. Thank you. All right. So, Madam Mayor, I'm sorry. I just have to have this point of clarification. In our last meeting, 
when we placed new items potentially up on the spreadsheet, we had to vote if we wanted staff to move forward to re conduct research and to come back with answers. We did that in our very last budget meeting and we actually had a, a vote that uh, rolled it all up into one vote, but it was explicitly stated that we had to vote for that. So if these are in the same vein, and perhaps they're not, you guys can tell me it's my first so we do my first five. year, but we, if these are in the same vein, then I believe we need to vote we do. as to whether we'd like staff I'm to proceed. I'm in my tenth year, and you're absolutely right. I think I, you are correct. I just <laughs> I, it takes five. It takes five people, and the two that are remaining that have not been voted on are the two that you see before you. So all in favor of employee of having staff prepare information on employee compensation with 3% inflation projection, please raise your hand. One, two, three. All right, that, that one, one, two, three, that, that fails. So we will not have that one come back. All right. All right, fire service costs for first responder medical calls. All in favor of having that researched and brought back, please raise your hand. One, two, three. That fails as well. So now we have all of the budget adjustments. Move to close the budget adjustments meeting. But Second. Did we, just, we didn't discuss, we don't recall discussing the e-bike pilot, the universal basic income, the uh, 17 or 18. So we, we, we had that discussion. I'm not sure if you were here. Here, but we I had. Know we had that discussion yeah, that was, I thought we had a motion. Yeah. yeah, we had a motion for some of them. Why don't we take the break this, this <coughs> and then come back so we're not okay. rushing through our three billion dollar budget? But that's why I asked for clarification, Mayor, because we did not get to those. So that's why I was asking for clarification. So, I, as I recall, um, we had a motion, and I said, "Is there anything that would be included in that section besides?" Um, Item, thir item 13, and I read those things, and I didn't think anyone said anything about it, so it was like approved for item 13. But if you would like to have that come up now and have a vote on whether or not that has five votes, that would certainly be pro appropriate for the record. All right, so, all right, any discussion we had, on? I mean, we had a budget process. Yeah. I thought we were doing, but this, this got totally... Because we pulled some out because of Councilmember Bakari's motion, but then we were still going to go back and, and go line by line for the other ones. I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go line by line then. Here we go. To... All right, under we're number 14. Go line by line. Number 14 is where item we start. 14. It is any discussion about item 14? Motion to motion to approve item number fourteen, I guess. All right, we have a motion. Do we have a second to approve item fourteen? Second. We have a second. Any discussion? Yeah. Any discussion? Mm -hmm. This was on here last time, right? Yes. yes. So yes. at this point, staff would have come back with some kind of analysis. So it would be put in the budget. To put in the yeah. It would come back with the cost, the analysis, the consequences. They already it did. Would, that's what I'm trying to understand. What they would do. No, they, they've yes. already done that. And so what's the number here? Yeah, what's that's the number? That. If you look at the detailed package. <laughs> yeah, it's on. It's, yeah, they don't have a number. They don't have a number for. They approved. <laughs> they, they wrote up a summary. There's a, there's a summary in this package about cities that have this and they have people that they've outsourced it to to operate and so it's, it's no cost to be determined because there is no cost that we have for doing that. So this is not a budget item then? Yeah. It is a budget item that was submitted by the Mayor Pro Tem <coughs> and if you want to know more about it. What I'm trying to understand is for intents and purposes to this budget it's a zero dollar amount? Because whatever the cost is, is outside of our budget. Right. Right? So, so I, we could extrapolate, Ryan, if you extrapolated from Denver, what would be based on a certain number of e-bikes? Well, based on what we got from Denver, it would cost an average of about $1,000 per bike. 
however you'd want to do it. Plus, we'd have to have someone to administer it. But we just put a to be determined because we didn't really want to choose a scale for Council Member Winston, which is why it's TBD with the write up. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor to ask the staff to do additional analysis on e bikes. Well, I, I don't think that's, I think it's to Mr. They've done their analysis. It's Mr. Winston's time to just say, this is what I want or not, right? They've done what you asked. I, uh, well, okay. Is How many e bikes would you like, Mr. Winston? You? <laughs> I think we have to say, we have to have a starting number. There was there was a whole in, idea about whether they're purchased, whether you know how do you do equity in them. There's a whole lot more in here than that in that section. I prefer i bikes. Yeah. E bikes are so like 2010. I bikes. AI bikes. Ooh. Yeah, that's just for the. the just the equity. How much are AI bikes, Ryan? <laughs> 500 e-bikes. For 500 e-bikes, yes. at what price? The 1,700, the 1,200, or the 500? I mean, staff literally, I mean, you want me to make up a number? No, I mean, no. I mean, like, that's it. They, they've said it's too, they, they, they haven't done their due diligence, so I can pull out a number right here, $1,000 per bike, that's what they're saying, so half a million dollars for e-bike pilot. Yeah, it would be about $569,000 for 500 e-bikes is our estimate. Okay. Backwards, yo. All right, so we have a motion to approve additional information that's our information that we have now which is e-bikes with a price point of ryan 569,000. uh i'm a little confused though are we the, the information was already voted and approved so we tried to provide the information we could research in that time period so it would be a, a this source is still at the point adjustment. that you could provide it as a budget adjustment for the 25th and come back with more information based upon that now i know there's a difference of opinion on this that some people are saying well we already have information well yes we do but i think that in in a way that everybody has the most he's he's right We're, this this has been researched now we're voting to put it in the budget or not right, right? like that's what that's what we're voting so that's what you'd like the motion is to put in 500, 500, dollars for e-bikes, for e-bikes. E yes. So uh, just as a point of clarification, that would just be the cost for the physical bikes. Wouldn't there be an operational cost associated with Each one needs running a pilot? A pilot? <laughs> That's we don't have clarity Double around it. We're comparing <laughs> ourselves to <laughs> guys. Okay, Deliver now if we, I, you know, any speech thirteen is already information okay, there. The yeah, I mean if. If you're going to all just read it, all the information is on there. No, we. I don't think we need to read it. We have a motion on the floor to have e-bike. Um, in the, included in the budget for a price of approximately five hundred sixty-nine thousand dollars. All right, is that your motion, Mayor Pro Tem? That is the motion. We have a second. Okay, who made the second? Miss Mayfield yes. made the second. All right, all in favor of that, please raise your hands. One, two. All right, the motion three. The motion fails. Okay. All right, let's go to the next item that I have is create a uni all right, create a universal basic income palette. And I think on this one, the report, there was some question about the ability to do that under our uh, current authority. Is that correct, Mr. Baker or Mr. Bergen? So we have at least one city in North Carolina that's done something on a very specific scale, and that's Durham around incarcerated. Um, other than mentioning that, 
Uh, we just tried to do it based on AMI, which is similar to other social services programs. Um, but even at 30% AMI, it's, it's quite a bit of money. That's actually the per month costs. All right, so you've seen the information that was presented by the staff on the universal income. Is there a motion to include universal income with an amount of money from the council? Hearing no motion, I assume that that would not be included in the budget. Okay. Do I need to ask for an opposing motion? We have no motion on the floor, so the motion dies unless someone else would like to make it. Okay. All right. The next item is provide additional funds for the digital divide initiative. Um, and I think the manager addressed this, and I don't know if it's worth repeating, but would you please, Mr. Jones, express? Sure. So thank you, there. Mayor. So one of the council's uh, new priorities at the annual strategy meet meeting was the digital divide. Uh, so we did have a combination of about $10 million of ARPA fund help us with implementation. Uh, we did talk to staff to see what um, providing additional um, resources for what the digital divide would, would uh, detail. And, um, I, and I'll tell you, we did vet this. I just feel a little bit uncomfortable that I don't know if this would be the best use of resources for the digital divide. Um, but I'm really, I'm, I'm, it seemed like the communication piece, um, the digital inclusion engagement funds makes a lot of sense. And I would see if there's an opportunity for us to look at some of the engagement funds we have throughout the organization to see if it could be more curtailed towards the digital divide. But that's just trying to provide some input on this. Is there a motion to include funding for the digital divide in the budget as an adjustment? Hearing, hearing no motion. In, so that any other items for adjustments that anyone else in the council would like to have additional information on before we proceed to the next part of our meeting. So it's uh, my item is still outstanding at the bottom on um, the uh, helicopter. Oh, no, well, the helicopter, Mr. Manager, I believe that we can we can move past just for the voting public out there. I'm not requesting a helicopter. Just want to be real clear. <laughs> um, but uh, to keep it there, yeah, we don't need to extend the meeting on Thursday for this to be an item. It is future budgets that obviously is very important. That's why I'm trying right. to bring it attention. But so I can back away from that one. And then the other one is up a little on the first section, and it is the um, uh, not the shifts, but the uh, the yeah number five. And I believe I'm going to. This would be the only reason we would have to meet Thursday. And from what I'm hearing from Ryan. This may be more process-based than budget-based, so I'm, I'm just not going to call for that one, and we will continue tracking the process of that down. Is there anything else from any other council member for an adjustment? All right. So do we need a motion to move forward? You're going to ask a question? I have one. I just because I think this is the last opportunity to do so. I did want to ask about the e-bike thing. I know the $500,000 one died, but I see that was based on the assumption of 500 bikes. I'm just trying to understand if there's appetite for a smaller quantity of bikes that would significantly reduce that item. I, so. I think you know, I know that particular item failed with right, the assumption that exactly. was there. I'm just curious. I, I guess what I would say is that if we're going to go into an e-bike program, 
Um, we've got our scooters. I think we ought to try to look at some information around it, but I don't know that it has to be constructed around the budget process because it can be something just like scooters. I mean, maybe we ought to be making some opportunities for, you know, companies to come in with the e-bikes and show us what they can do and see how that works. And in other cities, I think that they actually um, went out probably with an RFP and got those e-bikes out. So we'll I don't think it. it means that we, we can test it, we'll but test I think it. that we can figure something out yeah. about it. It's, it's not so urgent on the budget process for setting the tax rate and that kind of stuff. So. Perhaps we could get 11 e-bikes for a pilot? <laughs> yeah. Okay. 12, sorry. All right. Sorry, Madam Mayor. Okay, thank you. All right, so hearing no further discussions, do we need an action, Mr. DeBergman, to show the items that were approved? Well, if, if, uh, if we're talking about not meeting on Thursday, the, the typical motion that would end would be just to direct the city manager to prepare um, the budget based on move to direct the city manager to prepare the budget based upon the adjustments to the adjustments that have been made today and, and adopted and by before, the council and adopted by the council. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Any discussion on that motion? All in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. Any any opposition? There will be no meeting on Thursday. This was how the mech deck was created. Okay. All right. Let's we five minutes. Five minutes. Please bring your food in if you have to. Um, that would be great. Actually. Well, if if uh, if we're talking about not meeting on Thursday, the, the typical.